What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. And we are joined once again by TJ from TJ the Emperor on YouTube. What's up? Hello. Nice to be back. Yeah, it's really Great. nice yeah, to have you, to back have you back because I, I went through this section of the game today. <laughs> Do you have questions? I, I do. I, I have some questions. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, the th unfortunately, like, I took a bunch of notes on my laptop, and I had tabs open to, oh, like, Xenosaga wiki stuff. For, like, examples and stuff? And I, I left my laptop at home, okay. so I don't have those tabs open on my phone here, even though I have the notes. So I may be relying on TJ to, like, either tab over to Xenosaga wiki real quick or call, call in his knowledge. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> perfect, yes. perfect. So, uh, so we'll be relying on you to help us through uh, some of those things. But um, our plan today, we're actually going to record two episodes, though the first episode will likely be mostly on the opening scene, like the very first like FMV that plays. Yeah, and, and then a maybe little bit of the transition into kind of the future time period. Yeah. Um, we're gonna go all the way up at least to the end of the Gnosis attack on the ship, what's it called? The wind the wind <clears throat> what was it again? Uh, Woglinde. Yeah. The ship. <laughs> the Woglinde. Um because there's a save that happens like right after that sequence ends. Kay. I think that's a pretty good place to leave off. Um, so we'll see what we can do. Um, in any case, uh, Kason and I had recorded the first episode that was uploaded before yeah. we had TJ on, and we did it again, <laughs> where we went through this. Yeah. So we're kind of going through this a second time, and I want to make sure we don't miss, because there was some cool stuff that you had brought up, so I hope we have yeah. all the same notes and it's everything. it's all still so. in my same notes, so, yeah. yeah. So, okay, the very opening Yes. Of Xeno Saga episode one. Well, hold on. I actually want to start before that. Oh, go before that. Okay. We did not yet mention the subtitle of this game yet. Oh, yeah. I've got that here. Yes. I've got the... Because it actually brings up the title there right after it goes into space in between as it oh, transitions. Oh, okay. Then we can we can wait. So, yeah. I've got I've got that, though, because I wanted okay, to good, talk about good. that. Okay, good. Good. Okay. 20XX. I've get, I'm getting the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, vibes from Mega Man there. Oh, there you go. It's uh, This is what you do when you're trying to play it safe, right? Where yes. it's like, hey, we don't want it to be too far in the future, but we don't want it to seem too close either. Yeah. So let you fill in the gap with your mind, right? I'm pretty sure that in Perfect Works, it's they actually specify it's 2001. I was going to bring that up, yeah. Oh, really? it, it, is, yeah. it is specifically 2001 in Perfect Works. Which is a great reference to yes, 2001 exactly. A Space Odyssey. <laughs> I would think, right? However, this game was made after 2001, yeah. and so for believability's sake, <laughs> they put 20XX. This is a, yes, a different So universe. it could be 2099, could or it could be, be the year 2000. Could be. <laughs> so sometime yes. in this century, uh, A.D., at and then Lake we have Turkana in Kenya. So first we see just a just water and it says Lake Turkana, Kenya, yes. right? So you have a beautiful beautiful contrast. You have the desert and the water, right? And we start yeah. out with the water and it kind of pans over towards the desert. So the water of Lake Turkana is like a turquoise gem set in the midst of a golden desert. Yes. And it's beautiful because that's basically what this monolith the looks like. Of the, the Zohar, <laughs> yeah. right, with the green gem and, in it. And specifically, if you look at Lake Turkana from uh, Google Earth or from outer space, mm. you will see it have a specific turquoise-ish look to the water. Mm. Because this is not normal water. Lake Turkana is what they call brackish. It's brackish water. Yeah. And it's like kind of salty and kind of poisonous. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of not healthy for humans. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a jacked up lake. For whatever weird reason, this seems to be where the earliest humans like, like evolved, evolved and got their start. Yeah, it's incredible. So there's a tribe that lives near there called the Turkana tribe, and that's where, um, that's where the lake got its name. Uh, people have commented on the turquoise look of the lake because of an algae bloom that, for that same reason, some people also call it the Jade Sea, right? Yeah. And th these would, of course, be not local people <laughs> calling it these right. things. Um, but yeah, it's got that look. Uh, but also, it is um, the likely origin of humans. So the lake basin, there are tons of ancient humanoid skeletons going back four million years Holy that have been discovered. Crap. Tons. So basically, you can piece together the human evolution 
from pre like human erect human or homo erectus to you know homo sapiens just at lake turkana wow. which which kind of blows my mind because that lake isn't healthy water to, yeah, to, to drink. drink maybe it so, used to be well but there's the, like there's this idea now some people don't love the <laughs> guns germs and steel you've oh, heard of this yes, right I've, I've so read that book before. it's an anthropology kind of book and and it's 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 good it's good but some people like to poke holes in it and it's not perfect but one of the theories presented in it is that when it, animals that can survive in a more harsh climate will develop you know mm, quicker more, or quickly yeah. or become yeah. more efficient and they evolve to the terrain and if it's difficult terrain they'll probably die but if they happen to survive they'll have an advantage yeah. right over the other tribes other specialized people. for that so lake Turkana being this poison lake in the middle of africa you can you, like there you humans could have gone anywhere why why were they here and why did they flourish mm. here and why did they stay here humans have lived by lake Turkana for over four million years or the ancestors of humans there's like a lineage yeah that's that's insane that's for crazy. for a, an unhealthy lake however as we talked about before the process of filtering water right into it's almost like maybe maybe like that's where that was learned or something where it was uh, like hey we can't drink this lake we have to be we have to have ingenuity ingenious we need to exercise ingenuity <laughs> we need to have ingenious to solutions to, to the water problem filter and lo and behold somehow humans survived there for four million years not actually being able to drink that water yeah so i was really surprised to crazy. learn how long it like um the technology i guess for Filtrate water filtration has existed. It could be it's four million years old. Really <laughs> probably, probably not. It, and honestly, even if they were drinking, like digging wells and drinking, yeah. like not a well, we with the way we'd think about it, just a pit in the ground to drink water from, it would have still gone through a similar process of the water filtering from, from the lake the to the water table beneath the yeah, ground. Yeah. Right. But either way, for whatever reason, humans flourish next to this poisonous lake. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and this game posits a hypothesis as to why humans did so well. Yes. Because um, maybe there was some uh, some meddling from yeah, the from a higher outer civilizations. A higher, yes. Higher power. <laughs> yeah. So you have a group of archaeologists that are yes. digging here, um, and they discover this monolithic structure right this golden yes monolith called the zohar called the zohar now i have i just have a lot of notes here because this uh, is the intro of any media that you ever consume in your life is like the important one yes pay it's, attention it sets to. the it's, tone it's, it's making a promise to you exactly about where this is going right, right. or at least a, a, a good intro is generally um structured to do so yes uh, and often it will hint towards yes. it'll foreshadow what's going to yes. happen later right. if it's well done often it, the intro of a film or game or book is like foreshadowing for the whole yeah the it whole presents piece. a mystery where you go ooh it's a hook yeah, right like yep, ooh yep, what's yep. that all about and then okay we'll save that for later let's build up to that now yes right so but at this dig site there's well it's a bunch of um, local african people who are uh, at the dig but then there's one asian guy right and he is wearing a turquoise beanie cap, right? Mm, I didn't notice that. <laughs> this is, dude, they're, they're on the equator. <laughs> like, why is this guy wearing a beanie yeah, in a, the, the desert. desert of Kenya? Well, to, I would guess to protect their heads from the sun. Well, well, sure, I understand that. But a beanie, like, the, I think there's better anyway. Well, it's, uh, that could um, be it. But you want to protect your neck, uh, what too. What do you call it? Like thin cloth versus like a thick beanie. Exactly. Yeah. And something more along the lines of what they wear in Africa and the Middle East, um, that covers your neck as well. It's not just sure. like a bean cap, right? Sure. So that might tell me that this character is important. important. They're singling him out somehow. I believe you're correct. And the that. way they're doing this is, hey, amongst the, you know, golden desert and all the people, there's one person here wearing a turquoise cap. And it seems to be like the turquoise seems to me to be the marker of specialness in this game. So... Uh, let That's me, what let I Let me iterate again for those who skipped maybe episode one. Kason and I are playing this for the first time. We so have not played this game. We're, we're going to be guessing a little bit yes. at where things are going. And I TJ, am going to take it easy on the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to do that. I, I'm yeah. a lot more sensitive to spoilers than, than you are, for example. TJ, so I don't like them. TJ is our uh, current resident uh, expert yes. on Xenosaga. <laughs> 
episode one specifically more times than I care to admit. So, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> oh geez, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's gonna be. I'm I'm having tons of fun hearing all of your speculations. <laughs> I know this is this is the funny thing because you know what's up, right? But we will largely be speculating. Oh. Um, but it's not just. Yeah, you're still pointing yeah. stuff out that I like, like with the turquoise thing, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. this makes sense. I never would have like put that together, but it's like, yeah, I, I, you're making good observations. I like it. Well, I appreciate that. So yeah, the way that uh, they reveal the Zohar here, and it's Zohar. I, you find that out later on. They call it the Zohar yeah. uh, later on in this. Um, what episode, probably, for, yeah. or probably in the next episode is where yeah. they actually say Zohar. Right. But this is what it is. Not that that should mean much to you if you haven't played the game yet. So he's got a little silver-like key, but it's in the shape. It's sort of a crucifix, almost, yeah, almost. but it's like wider, and yeah. it's like a mix between just a tall monolith, like from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and a crucifix. It's like yeah. kind of a halfway point between the two. Uh, so he's got a silver one, right? And silver is... Silver is the color of the moon, right? Yes. And so you have him setting down the silver, he's setting down the moon, and as he does that, as the moon sets, the golden monolith Arises. rises. Yeah. And so this is this is dawn, right? This is the morning, this yep. is dawn. The dawn of a new era, right? The moon is set, the small silver moon is the set, and now the moon. golden sun has, has arisen from the water mm -hmm. and brings with it rain from the clouds. Anyways, there's lots of beautiful symbolism going on. This is just beautiful. Um, but yeah, the, the sun, so this golden monolith reaches up into heaven with its turquoise power and causes it to rain. This could mean a lot of things, but I'm not gonna speculate too much on it for now. But the last shot that we see of this whole thing is um, the golden obelisk zoomed out with the turquoise gem, a turquoise gem at the center, mm -hmm. shooting a beam upwards, a great light source, right? And the rain coming down upon the dry land. So this is the power of the sun god that rises from the water and causes the rain on the dry desert land. Um, so it's it's seeding the earth with fruitful things, right? So yeah. so this is a new dawn and life life shall become abundant because of this obelisk. And it should be noted, I think, um, at least from what I remember, the when the cutscene started, the, the there was not a cloud in the sky. Ah, ah, yes, yes. That so is, so it point. was like totally sun, clear blue sky as far as you yeah. can see. And then as soon as that happens, overcast, just torrential, like, you know, like almost almost as if it's like the flood of Noah. It's just Almost like a flood, I was going to say. So th this obelisk summons the clouds out of the sky, right? And then brings forth the water onto the ground. Yeah, so it's hard for me to tell based on this scene. Are they going for a flood or is this going for, is this life sustaining or is it life ending? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've always interpreted yeah. it as like, um, as sort of in, in a more biblical sense, like, you mm -hmm. know, drawing from Genesis, like we're talking about the flood. Like I've always interpreted like, this scene as like them activating the Zohar is sort of in their own way, like doing like a reading almost like, um, sort of the, like the Garden of Eden story from Genesis, not ah. in not in like a sort of like overly Christian like these people are sinning kind of way, but like if you right. sort of read that story like removed from a sort of Christian reading of it, it's like the you know the earliest humans they come to like a point in you know in their development or whatever, you know they trespass and they have to like you know, leave their ancestral, you know, paradise home or whatever and go off into the wider world without the protection of God. Well, it sounds like they got to build themselves an ark real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, This is sort of, I mean, this is sort of jumping ahead to like the next scene, but like, you know, af you know, in the next scene, it's like everyone, nobody's living on earth anymore. I know what happened, right? Mm. That That's the first biggest mystery. Well, the first one is what is this thing, right? But the second one is where, why... What happened, yeah. right? Like, there's this huge time skip, 4,000 years later. And we're left wondering, like, okay, now this is what's happening now, but, like, what what happened during that time? During that right? time. Well, you, there's also a, a couple other things to consider, too. You have the Gnostic reinterpretation of the Garden of Eden story. Mm, with the Demiurge, Which is yeah. that, uh, you know, of course... If you haven't seen our Xenogears analysis, <laughs> I'm not going to do, like, a full breakdown of this. Go okay, back and yeah. watch that. But in, in short, 
the Gnostic reinterpretation of the Garden of Eden story mm -hmm. is that the God, the Demiurge, was yes. an impure being in the physical realm. Yeah, it was like a sub-god right? almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the snake that comes to Adam and Eve and, and gives them the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the word gnosis is Greek for knowledge. Yes. Yep. Is actually... Oh, that's important for this yeah, game. Yeah, <laughs> actually Jesus offering them knowledge so that they can yes. leave the prison of the Garden of Eden and actually advance and, to become like God, right? Yeah. To become more like God. Yeah. So that it was a good thing. Yeah. It was actually a, a good thing, getting them away from the power of the demiurge. Yeah. So uh, if you if That's you couple that with the direct reference, obviously, to two thousand one: A Space Odyssey, which is anytime yeah. humanity comes in contact with this obelisk, they are given a a, a enormous amount of knowledge. They are advanced or evolved That's right. That's highly. Right. Yeah. This contact with the Zohar is basically Gnosis being given to the human race. Yeah, like it's being beamed, bestowed yeah. or rained upon them. There right? you go. Yes. The, so the Gnosis, the rain would be something like the, the knowledge of the heavens. Sure. Yeah. That can make so, that can work. So that word Gnosis, it refers specifically to like a sort of a spiritual or, or mystical knowledge. It's like knowledge from within that is deeper than just, you know, what we can see and touch and feel. It's mm. like a, a, a knowledge that pierces into like another realm. Yeah, where, yeah. Where, um, like a divine. The monad would be, right? Mm, Which yep. is like what is considered the spiritual, pure, perfect God, right? Yeah. So um, uh, it feels to me like this contact with the Zohar, that's what's happening, that that rain is gnosis being dumped upon humanity in yeah. this 20XX80 Th era. Their cup runneth over. <laughs> yes. yes. And then that is what takes them to, it makes possible the 4,000 year I, galactic that's what I civilization. Gathered. Yeah, yeah. In the same way that the bone that flies up in yep. 2001 turns into the uh, the satellite. Yeah, yeah the satellite. that makes it's sense because, like, yeah, I've always interpreted yeah. like the, the that super like crazy time skip is like a direct reference to that scene from the 2001 it, film. That definitely yeah, feels yeah. like it, because it goes, yeah, just from that, like, I, I can't remember exactly what shot it is, but then just, like, directly to space, and that's the yes. first th thought I had. That's a, <coughs> so that's a very direct connection. I suppose that the direct connection here is that when we are 4,000 years later in space, we see the same obelisk again, just yes. floating in space. In space, So right. that's the similar connection. I, yeah, I see that. Right. Now, my question that I do not want you to answer, TJ, <laughs> I can't emphasize that enough. Is this the same obelisk? Is this the same Well, one? I thought they answered it in what we played. That it's not? Yes. Okay. I thought, I, well, I have the idea that it's not okay. the same one. <laughs> my note that I took here as I was playing says, is it? I don't think it's the same one. Yes. It, it, so that's answered. It's I not thought, the same I one. I thought they say it right at the end there where uh, Cosmos, Cosmos is talking movies. to somebody. And she says something like, oh, it was an emulator or something like oh, that. Oh, but like, okay, I see. I do Not get that. Not the original. I do get that. Okay, I understand that. I do. Hmm. Is this the same one, the one that's floating in space? Is it the same one that's in the ship? In the ship, I yeah, would say yes. It's the same one. Okay, okay. Yes. All right, all right. I, I've got some questions. But yes, okay. <laughs> it didn't appear to me to be the same one either. Oh, you're saying the one found outside in space not being the same one that's inside of the hangar of the ship. I actually was saying the one on Earth being oh, the, the same as the okay. one in space, right? Okay. But there's a marking There's a marking that's different. So this one oh. in outer space does not have a turquoise gem. It doesn't. It does not. Oh, Instead, I didn't notice that. It, it has, has the, the X on it. Well, it's a X. Hebrew letter. It's almost an X. It's actually a very, It's so it's the Hebrew letter Aleph. Okay. It's the A, the letter A in, oh, in Hebrew. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. However, it's the letter A in modern Hebrew. Oh. And so huh. I don't know what that's trying to say at the moment. I don't. I'm sure there will be an uh, Aleph and then Taft was the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter T, which was the cross. Uh, or if they're going to do an Alpha Omega kind of thing mm. or whatever. The early, I th if this was to be like the old one and it's like that marking says something about how the Zohar taught people language and things. The ancient Hebrew letter A looks very different to the modern Hebrew letter A. Interesting. Yeah. But anyway, so this is a current, current modern Hebrew um, letter Aleph, which is the letter A in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and that's what's on this monolith, not the turquoise gem. That gem is gone. Okay. So whether that is the emulator or not, I don't know. 
Okay. I've, I have questions about that. But sure. it, it, does, it is not the same monolith as what was on Earth. Okay. Um, this is where the title of the game comes up on the screen. Yeah. It's Xenosaga Episode 1, uh, Der Will Zur Macht. Der Will Zur Macht. Yes. There you go. Which means the will for power. That is the translation yes. from German. Uh, the will to power, specifically referencing a Nietzsche book. Oh, that's that a is, book, yeah. Well, I mean, it could be. It can, could be translated either way, but I've heard it, the will to power. The will to power. That's what I yeah. mostly Well, I, I actually did it twice, so I, I translated it from two different ones, and uh, I, I wasn't sure which one was right, so I wrote down four power. But just two in power, reference if, to the book. If it's a reference to the book, which it probably is. It is, because yeah. the book is called, because Nietzsche was German. Right. The book is called Der Wille, Der Wille, Der Wille zur Macht. Okay. So okay. that's good stuff. The will um, to power. So we've, have we've a, already got some Nietzschean influences. They're going to kind of creep in here. I've got a quote from Takahashi about this. Oh, quick. good, please. Um, says the people in this game are all living with some past put upon them, filled with regrets and unavoidable destinies. They all need to find their own identity, and they all need to find the power to go on in life. That's the desire for power I wanted to ah, show in the story. There you go. The villains in the story are exactly the same. As the game goes on, their wills begin to clash with those of other people. So yeah. that's why he wanted to call it that. Well, I will have more to say about that later on as these things happen. Yeah. Um, because that is, yeah, that is a very Nietzschean idea. Yeah. You become nihilistic and then you need to will yourself to the next level of life, right? Yep. So an OS is being booted up. <laughs> yeah. I copied some of this um, dialogue down because I know that in our Xeno Gears analysis, it can seem at first in the opening cutscene of that game like that uh, techno babble is just that, but it actually yeah. isn't. It's mm. actually all like very thoughtfully written, <laughs> uh, and it all means something. There's tons of acronyms, tons of uh, yeah. yeah. And so I wrote it down. Of course, I ha I haven't played this game, so I haven't done like research into all these terms and things necessarily right. yet, but there's a few uh, interesting terms here that I want to keep an eye on as we play. So, partition open, proceeding with Cosmos body formation, uh, body formation complete, so they're creating a body for Cosmos it seems here. Um, commencing Penfield mapping, I thought that was interesting. Um, is Penfield a name? I know that there's a couple other names. I think that comes from I think like neuroscience, or I, I think a lot yeah. of these terms in this scene mm. specifically come from are like neuroscientific, like technical terms, which is not yeah. a field that I'm super like knowledgeable <laughs> <Me either>. about. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, they, they talk about the Hilbert. Uh, I did look or into that one. Or the Hilbert effect later. Hilbert I effect, know that that's yes. uh, specifically somebody um, who is a real mathematician. I looked him up a little bit, and you know some of his contributions to mathematics. So I was wondering if Penfield might be the same, but I, I think it is a real person. I can look him up really quick. Because mm -hmm. that's that's what I learned from Xenogears is basically any time they have a name for a thing, it's, <laughs> it's probably like named after a scientist or psychologist yeah, or yeah. you know a philosopher or something like that. <laughs> mm. Almost every case. So commencing Penfield mapping, proceeding with encephalon construction. For those who don't know what encephalon is, that's basically just a brain. Um, oh, cool. So with they're they're creating the, the the brain here in the simulation. Encephalon construction complete. There's noise appearing in the temporal lobe. It's on the left side of the temporal lobe. It's uh, or I'm showing slight simul or stimulation of the synapses in section eight one eight. It's within permissible bounds though. Do you want to abort? And so now we're introduced to yeah. our main character, Shion. Uh, Uzuki, by the way, her last name is Uzuki, which is the Uzuki. same last name as Saitan in Xenogears. Anyway, nice. not that not that there's any connection really, other than this is a spiritual successor. Just a last name. Um, no, let's keep going. She says, just stick to the menu. I'll try for a direct approach. Back me up. And uh, it's Alan who is like the the kind of the lead operator on the outside. It says Roger, uh, launching. Nataraja connection system. I didn't know if there was a connection. I, I looked in I, okay. one, yeah. Did you find it? I did. What is that about? <laughs> so Nataraja is Hindu. So the system is called Nataraja, which is the, a depiction. It's not just the goddess. It's Shiva. It's the goddess Shiva. Oh, that's right. But, I did find that. Now okay. That I think about it. But yeah. it's, it's the name of the dance that Shiva yes, does. Yes, right. And, and it's depicted. You see Shiva doing this like dance, surrounded by a, a ring of fire. Yeah. Right? So there's some good symbolism there. Um, Shiva 
is performing as the divine cosmic dancer in the Nataraja um, pose. I don't know, how, I don't yeah, know exactly like how, specific, what to call it. It's like a statue that It's it a shows. pose, but they call it a dance. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So the word uh, Nataraja is Sanskrit for the term Nata, which means to act or drama, and then Raja, which means king or lord. So Nataraja is the king of the dance, right? Mm. Um, and the, the important thing to know about Nataraja is the calmness of this goddess while performing the, uh, like, what would you call it? Like a world, like this, this divine dance. This cosmic dance is being done in tranquility. Right? Got it as is true with uh, lots of Hindu stuff. Any idea on why this connection system might be called that in relation to... I have an idea. Okay. I do have an idea. I don't know if I should say it because I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's really right. <laughs> it, oh, be, at least in part, it is what I just said. The And the, you see this all throughout this freaking... What's her name? What's the thing? Cosmos. Yeah. Everything Cosmos does is... This beautiful, calm, beautiful dance. -like yes, it's chore like it's exactly. Okay. Yes, and it's all it. as if like the end of the world is happening, and it, or and the beginning of the world is happening. Like both of these things are happening, but at the same time, it's just calm and serene and 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 just abstract and beautiful and peaceful. Mm. And that is cosmos in relation to everything that cosmos is doing and is happening around. Well, that that would so. make sense. Uh, having a sort of a godlike figure represent yes. cosmos. Well, especially the name cosmos. In, well, <laughs> right. yeah. In in light of even some of these characters who I assume are going to be villains in the game, being mm. kind of afraid of its power. Right. And, like the gnosis being like nothing in comparison oh, to it. Right? That's the other weird thing. Cosmos is called an anti gnosis. Yes. Weapon. Anti gnosis. That's yeah. that's a very. But I, 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 think about I thought that. about that too. Yes. I now, thought about that too in light of what things. Gnosis is. Be right? Exactly, because I didn't know that the Gnosis were demon ghost monsters until right. later on, just an hour later. But right. I didn't know what a Gnosis was. When I saw the word anti-Gnosis, I'm like, wait, go back to the Garden of Eden. Yes. Anti-Gnosis, that's the Demiurge, right? Yes. The Demiurge does not want to give Gnosis. The Demiurge yes. is ignorant and wants humans to be ignorant, right? So this is the ignorant weapon, the, uh, the here, weapon of yes. ignorance. This is, this, is actually, this is actually really interesting because, yeah. and again, we're speculating because we haven't played the game. I know, but, but this I'm is all placed here. a little bit, but I think something, Getting my ahead of myself just a bit, but I want to say it since we're on the topic of this now. Yeah, Milsha. Whatever happened oh, yeah. at Milsha regarding the Zohar must have had something to do with the Gnosis arriving. Sure, sure. And I gather more or less. I think what the game yeah. is setting up here is that we're go it's going to present the Gnosis as if they are. Terrible ghost, alien, scary monsters. Uh, okay. But because okay. they're called Gnosis, which directly makes me think you're on to something with Cosmos being, anyways. Anti if people can, like. Yes, extrapolate that, that <laughs> thought out, if you will. That's what I'm guessing this is. That's what I'm guessing this is going. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> so they're running a simulation here. Yeah. And it, they're, they're doing tests with Cosmos in simulation. They, they have not started field testing Cosmos yet. Cosmos is essentially a weapon that's meant to um, combat these, these Gnosis, these alien beings almost on another plane of existence that can interact with uh, real space or normal space, but the, the people we in normal space can't seem to really interact with them. It's like they have the ability uh, yeah, to yeah. come through and kill us, but we can't yeah, hit yeah. them. Um, and so Cosmos is specifically designed to be able to be this anti-Gnosis weapon, but anti she's still in phases of testing. And they've been doing this for a long time. It's a long time development. And Xion yes. is the lead sort of scientist on this particular group that's like testing this weapon. Yes. And so, she built this, the new system, the Nataraja system, I believe. Something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, right. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, um... She's going to enter the simulation and sort of interact with Cosmos and observe as they're, you know, taking their data down. Yeah. And she's she's kind of like pushing it a bit. Like she wants to advance faster mm. than they are like um, scheduled to go. 
And so Alan on the outside is like, no, we can't go to the 400 series yet. We haven't mm -hmm. completed the 300 Remember series. Remember what happened last time yeah, you there's some, were rash and yeah. made a poor decision? There was some sort of yeah. incident that happened before. Yeah. And we learn more about that as we continue on. But she seems to disregard those warnings and say, no, we need to proceed. I think it's going to be okay this time. Um, so she puts on like this, this red like goggle, almost like a VR headset. She puts on an Oculus, and what's great, <laughs> what's great, <laughs> yeah. it, it basically is, except it just got like haptic feedback, something or other. Yeah, like, it's, it's like Oculus mixed with like those things that like jack you into the Matrix from the Matrix trilogy. Oh yeah, that like stabs you in the brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like if you die in the Matrix, you die in real life. Yes, I, I can feel that, I can feel that, because this guy is really worried about her. He's like, mm. you could actually die for reals, right? If you die in the game, you die in the real, right? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> this is a note. <laughs> we already, we've already well passed this note, but um, I just wanted to take note of this setting before the systems booted up and everything. I wrote, there's a sick black <laughs> snowmobile in there, oh. and then the girl gets into a dentist chair and uh, then puts on that, you know, oh, Oculus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny. There's a there's a logo called Vector, I think. Yes, yeah, so that's the name of this group yeah. that's developing it. The staff. Yeah, it's like yeah. a company is yeah. more or less what I gathered. Yeah. And there's a little because. I gathered it's a company because there's like a subtitle. It says like a, what, what's the word? Like a, a catch phrase, a slogan. It says here, the future. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I wonder if that was translated perfectly, but um, anyways, yeah, here, the future. I didn't see that, that's interesting. Yeah, it's like in small text. So this is a corporate <laughs> company. This yes. is a, a private business, right? Yeah. A contractor with uh, the military. Well, it would probably be, yeah, a contractor with the military yeah. to develop so like, a weapon. Yeah, yeah. kind of like um, in Metal Gear Solid, we were talking about uh, yes. not Anderson, the other guy, Kenneth Baker. Oh, Baker, yeah. yes, for um, that company, yeah. For yeah. Arms Tech company. For Arms Tech, yeah. yeah. So Arms Tech would be like Vector. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. I also want to just point this out real quick. So these characters all have the same uniform. Well, the women have a slightly different uniform than the men. And there's some color differences between everybody. But for the most part, they all are wearing the same uniform. Yes. That has a shape of the obelisk kind of shape is like part of the uniform. Mm. Right? So there's a bit of a green motif, like turquoise-ish green, uh, with golden. Right, and it's in a key shape as it kind of goes mm -hmm. up, especially on from the back. She's got the purple, right? She has, maybe. I think it's purple in her. Is there purple? Yeah, Shion. Shion. Is blue? It blue? Okay. Let me, let me see. Okay, okay. And then the girl has the shape on her neck because, like, just the lapel, like, just the way her uniform fits. Yeah, and she's wearing this, like, special necklace kind of thing on her neck. But it makes the shape of the obelisk. And like that's kind of negative space there, but it's a sh the shape is um, of the obelisk, and it's right there on her, like clavicle, kind of like um, her wishbone. Yeah. So clearly, what I can gather from this, clearly this monolith has had a big hand in shaping the development of hu of humanity over these past four thousand years, and they know it, right? Mm. It's almost like a religious reverence, like they they are clad in garments that resemble this this item. Yeah. Okay, so from the character art, it looks blue. From the character model in the game, it looks very purple to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm supposed to take from that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. The, it definitely, it definitely green, looks blue um, in the Maybe it was art. in some of the other characters, it's green. I think the other characters have different colors. Yeah. But she... Because she's like the leader, the right? The leader, yeah. Yeah, I feel like the colors kind of like show her level, right? Her, um, yeah. her seniority. Sure. All right. So, okay. Um, could we have Cosmos getting booted up actually into the simulation here? Yeah, you kind of see it like like flash oh, in. I had another. I, this is just a kind of a note. So um, when we were originally planning this uh, podcast series, um, I had several people who were giving me recommendations on how to make the game. Uh, I don't know, like more playable in the modern age, kind of a thing. You know, mm. if you play it. Um, there are mods for it that make the battle speed faster. Um, you can play an undubbed version with the Japanese voices yeah, yeah. Uh, and English subtitles. And the people who were suggesting this to me were saying, uh, avoid this terrible 
English voice acting at all costs. Yes, and I had always, yes. I had always heard that, and then I watched TJ's videos. Tell, tell us, tell us real quick about the um, the the English the voice cast and the and the localization team, because I was really surprised to learn this. Yeah. Okay. So the the English dub for uh, episode one, it was uh, it was made by a company called Anime Studios and directed by the basically the head of Anime Studios, a guy named Kevin Seymour. And this is probably not a name that like a lot of people would just recognize, sure. um, but they are responsible. They mostly like they've done some video game stuff, but they've most of their like really famous work has been in in, in anime dubbing. As and the name suggests, that's yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but they are probably at least for people in the United States, they're like probably most famous for doing the dub for Cowboy Bebop. And uh, Ghost in the oh. Shell. They've done, I think, basically all of, or most of Ghost in the Shell. And they okay, s- and those were done by the same company as well. Th- right? Those are done by yeah. the same company. Yeah, they sort of have like a the animation. Yes, um, and they sort of have a history of like, um, at least with their anime stuff. Like, a lot of people who are in the know, like, say like the English dubs, especially for stuff like Cowboy Bebop and Ghost in the Shell, are just as good if not better than the original japanese i i will say they are quite good yeah yeah and i've always um i've always been a fan of the dub of this game i didn't know that there was like a a group of a contingent of people who like hated it um yeah well i will say the beginning the very intro cutscene the like the where they unearth fmv yeah, yeah the very intro fmv is not Good. I don't know who that guy is with the beanie and in a <laughs> thousand degree weather, but whoever, I, that's just, it was not well done. The voice acting in that scene is not good. I have not heard any other English voice acting other than I that would, opening I would scene. say it's like at least perfectly serviceable so far. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I'll give him, yeah, I mean, it's not mm. like great for... I just I, know that I, opening. I would say any problems that I've had with lines are not at all to do with like, oh, that voice actor definitely messed that up. Oh, it's, it's the like writing. The writing the translation. is just awkward or yeah. something. Sure. And so like, how do you deliver that line any other way, really? Right. I got you. You know what's funny? You bring up Cowboy Bebop. Um, in the next episode, we will be introduced to a character who is voiced by Jet in Japanese. The oh, je- the, the Japanese, Japanese jet, jet voices the Japanese character, character but, um, in this game. And there are probably others. So it may be the same company that did Cowboy Bebop in Japanese also did just the voice acting in general for uh, for the Japanese version. I will say the English Jet voices a character later on in the game as well. Oh, really? Um, okay. As, as well, well as May, right? As well as, uh, yeah, the voice of uh, Wendy, Faye, Lee. Faye, Wendy Lee. The Faye voice of Valentine. Faye. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's, she's in this? <coughs> I don't know if she is in the Japanese. I'll have to check in that. Is it, are, are, were those the only two uh, Cowboy Bebop voice actors? Off, yeah, I mean, like, as far as, like, major voice actors from Cowboy Bebop, I believe so. Like, yeah. Steve Bloom isn't in this game. Um, no, no, right. And there might be, like, some minor characters who are in Cowboy Bebop, but, like, as far as the major ones, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, cool. I don't know, like, I, I had heard that, and then I, I, I watched your video, and I was like, oh... That that can't be that bad then. Like if, like that's the team doing it. If those are some, if that's some of the talent, and so like so far I'm listening to it and it's like, dude, like this is fine. This is good as far as I'm concerned. Mm, like, cool. I don't think this is bad at all. Yeah, I always sure. thought that most people like the voice acting for this game. I know, like for episode two, I know there are a lot of people, including myself, who thought the voice acting in that game wasn't that great. But I've, I've never heard mm. any sort of negativity of that scale for this one. Certainly not. Yeah. It's just that opening cutscene, man. <laughs> and I don't know that those actors surface again in the game or not. I don't know, but um, like, it would make sense if they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Because that was just a short one-off thing. But, I mean, this this was mm. this was true even of like the Xenogears anime scenes for the most part. Like, they're fairly oh. well voiced. Like even Actually, like small yeah. role, like small characters, NPC type people, the the operators mm. who are like shouting out all the stuff that's happening during the, the takeover of the ship, and yeah. I feel like it's similar. Like all these secondary characters on the on the crew working on Cosmos who are like teasing Alan because yeah. he obviously likes 
Shion. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. It's like they're not. None of them are what I would expect. Small role voice acting <laughs> of that mm, era to be like, okay. where it's like you have maybe a couple key good actors you hired to and do. And everyone else people, is like the and intern everyone else is like downstairs. Me, me, and they're like grindy, <laughs> terrible voices. They're yeah. not. I mean, they're all pretty okay, good. Okay, good. Good. So okay, I don't know. I don't. I don't. For for all it's worth, like my opinion, I think it's just fine. So okay. Cool. Um, so thanks. I wanted to let you take that, TJ, because I thought that was fascinating that yeah. an anime studio as renowned as that one was doing the work on this. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't know how they got involved, but yeah, I'm glad they did. Um, so uh, in between these sh clips, these shots of whatever's happening with Cosmos and uh, Shion, we also get uh, kind of a cutscene that goes into outer space, that goes into... Mm -hmm. The, this monolith that's just floating in the middle of nowhere. Right. And you got these two little robots that show up and kind of grab right. onto it on the sides. And the they have wing-ish type things. They, well, what I wrote down is that they look like two little cherubs, mm. right? And of course, the cherubim are on either side of the Ark of the Covenant in uh, right. the Book of Exodus. And so um, you get the imagery of two cherubim holding this golden, like, you know, obelisk, basically. And then a human approaches it, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happens at the moment. <laughs> but he touches it and disappears. Yep. Yeah. He is gone. Yep. Um, if my Ark of the Covenant motif, with the, if that is correct, then he went somewhere very special. <laughs> like the Holy of Holies or something. But if um, I'm wrong, I mean, I just don't know. I have no idea where he went. I can't tell exactly what this is and how many of these obelisks there are. Yeah, or I if keep this saying obelisk. The, I mean, monolith. if this was the same one, yeah, is this the same one? The Do they all the function this way? Right, because that one at the beginning of the game kind of materializes from nothing. It's kind yeah. of like beamed in. It's not like it rises from the earth. It just kind of like, yeah, it holograms in, and then it's there. You know. Mm. So, anyways, I'm, I'm kind of confused as to how many there are and and what exactly they do. Yeah. There were uh, yeah. a few fatalities they mentioned later on of, of people coming in contact and disappearing. Yes, that's right, that's right. Thing. So once yeah. you touch it, something happens. happens to you. And yep. having played Xenogears, I feel like we should avoid speculations that have to do with Xenogears because sure. they're probably right. <laughs> 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 but if you've played Xenogears, anyways, that's where I'm coming from. So yeah. there, there could be a whole thing happening here yep. that is you know interesting, but I don't want to say what it is. Um, so, Cosmos introduces herself here as an anti-gnosis humanoid yeah. fighting system. See, Serial number 0000000001. One. one. <laughs> I love that. So, they are planning on making a million of these things. Yeah, right. But this is the first one. The right? first one. Uh, so, uh, well, what do you, all, all of you, what do you think of introducing the term anti-gnosis before gnosis? Yeah, that's a good question uh, because I was actually I was actually thinking about this as I was playing through it. I was like, they don't show the gnosis for a long mm, time. It takes a while, a couple it, hours. And if you don't talk to NPCs, yeah. it's very likely you won't know anything about them until that scene happens. Right. Because it's through talking to the NPCs that you get them speculating on: Are the gnosis even real? Was it made up by the right. government as some conspiracy to? Right. You know, like. Go ahead, TJ. I think there's a cutscene later where they're on the bridge of the ship and, like, it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but, like, they're sort of talking about... Don't they mention the Gnosis there, too? In one Cher of the uh, uh, Cher 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 Cherkov? Cherenkov. Oh. He does, yes. Um, when when Shion brings the data to him finally after mm. a long time... And, and he's, he's just, like, like, beating everybody? Do you understand? <laughs> no, that's that's Vander oh, okay. Different guy. Um, Basically uh, the, the same commander, character. Cherenkov is pissed because the data is not complete or up to schedule with what was promised or something. Oh, and, and I she's see saying what you mean. It's going to take more time. And he's uh, like, "Do you realize yes. like why you're here? I remember. Cosmos is the only thing yeah. that can protect us from the Gnosis, and the they Gnosis. could attack at any attack. So yeah. that's when they officially, in a cutscene, yeah, I think for the first time mention Gnosis. But I could be, I could be wrong about that. Maybe they say something about that earlier. I think you're right, and I, I never thought it was that. Weird. Like, it never struck me as odd because, I mean, c coming at it from, like, there's so much, like, as far in terms of, like, world building and lore just that they have to introduce, like, right yeah. away at this oh, point yeah. in the game. That's why and, like, we've only got ten minutes into the game so far. Yeah, so, so, like, for me it was always, like, it was just a matter of practicality. Like, at this point, you know, they're... 
you know, what's most important is like introducing Xion and Cosmos and their relationship with one another. Um, right. I do think it's I do think it's an interesting choice. Like it's it's putting a lot of faith in the the player to like sort of imply that the existence of these things called the Gnosis, but not like spell out what they are just yet. Yes, um, just sort of put because... it together with like just context clues, and I think it works. Right. I think you can do it, but it's like most games don't yeah. do that. Like they spell right. it out very directly. Right. I think so too. I think just knowing if you did, if you don't, if you first played this game and did not know that gnosis means knowledge, yes, it works. It's yes. fine. Yes, doesn't matter. Totally. If you play this game knowing that gnosis means knowledge, and just every time you see the word gnosis, you just put the word knowledge in your mind. <laughs> and it, it honestly, I think that is done on purpose, right? Yeah. But I think there's a layer, there's a layered reality going on here that when they say things like, "Oh, we need to be protected from the gnosis," I think. You are, I think the word knowledge is going to be interchangeable with mm. it. So whenever they talk about the Gnosis, oh, the Gnosis are killing us, right? Talking, just putting the word knowledge in there. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like I'm getting a deeper reading into the theme of the game already, just at the very beginning. Sure. Here. Uh, but also, I, it might be a good practice for people playing the game right now. Like, just put the word knowledge in there and, and see if you can gain any more insights into what and, this game's trying to specifically say. specifically, a very special, mystical, supernatural, like, higher order level of knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, like, right. like a, knowledge like of a good spiritual, and evil. Yeah, spiritual knowledge. Deep knowledge, profound, yeah. like, transcendent type knowledge. The knowledge of the gods, right? Yeah, right. Which, which can be considered a curse, right? Sure. To have, oh, I wish we didn't have this knowledge that of the gods. You know, I wish we could just be monkeys minding our own business, you know? <laughs> Instead, we've got this knowledge of the future, the, the, and we uh, know we're gonna die, and... The proverb or adage, uh, uh, ignorance is bliss, right? Yes, exactly. Which that, and many people, that, uh, the Matrix... And, the, the, dude, yeah. the dude who gets them all wrong, all the proverbs wrong, oh. he would have gotten that wrong, probably, <laughs> or substituted it for something else. But. Bl bl ignorance is... <laughs> is. <laughs> Whatever. So, uh, development name, KPX, abbreviated name, Cosmos. I am currently configured for a simulated battle. My output is limited to 22% of its normal capacity. My estimated weapon specifications, she just goes on and on and on. Yes, yeah, classic. So, Shion cuts classic. in. Yeah, right. Uh, she asks if Cosmos feels sad. And she gives yes. this minute-long answer explaining how <laughs> her emotion module works, uh, how it works. And that at this time it's not necessary to use uh, as an expression of sadness or something along those lines. So <laughs> that's so funny. So she, the, so Cosmos cannot think in the abstract or cannot project into the future uh, a hypothetical, but can only deal with the present. Like, yeah. yes, sadness is a possibility, but I don't. It, it, I have it's no use not for that. Necessary at, the moment. at this time to emulate yeah. for your sake sadness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so to to test whether or not these emotions work, you need to actually create the situation for right. the emotions to happen. Yeah. Instead of just asking, posing a hypothetical where yeah. they're like, "What are you talking about?" I'm not. Yeah. Idea. But that's good, you know. Robotics, robots can't feel emotions, you know, yeah. all that stuff. That's good. Uh, Xion mentions having mixed emotions about what's going on. She's mm. sad that Cosmos will have to be put back to sleep after this uh, yes. exercise is over. Um, and that the next time she's awoken, it may be in a time of bloodshed or a time of war, mm, right? She hopes yeah, that that day never right. comes. So her mixed feelings are, I've been working on Cosmos. I sort of have, you know, mixed feelings about this creation I have, obviously. But awaking her means it's going to be a really bad time. So, like, yes. I don't know what to do. I don't want you to go to sleep, but I don't want you to be awake either. <laughs> there is an impending apocalypse where she will need to yeah. call upon the name <clears throat> of Cosmos to yes. save her. Um, so this serves as the tutorial here, this whole simulation. It's yeah. pretty long. And it's got the company logo like on the ground oh, and yeah. stuff. Mm. I just, it's classic, yeah. Um, how do you feel, TJ, about battles in this game overall? Battle system, but even like, uh, say, speed of battles. Uh, almost everyone that I'm talking to about it on my Discord complains about the, the slow, slow animations and yeah. how long it takes. Um, what are your feelings about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I can definitely like I can definitely see that. Like for me, I'm like maybe it's cuz I grew up with like a lot of these games like 
this one and like i know people have said the same thing like complain about final fantasy 9 specifically and about how slow that battle Mm -hmm. system is and like i play it and i'm like that's my favorite one (laughs) yeah and i'm like whatever this is fine and so i think Mm -hmm. part of it is just that's what i'm used to but like looking at it from especially from like a more modern perspective like it does it definitely is slower than a lot of modern games there's no way to um you know, in, in there's no way to skip like battle animations, and some of them can get like you know later on in the game can get kind of long, and there's just no way to skip them. Um, so I mean, I can see where people are coming from, but I guess it doesn't bother me that much. Doesn't bother you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, I grew up with these kinds of games too, and I agree. Final Fantasy IX's battle system is super slow. I mean, upon the first time playing, I didn't think that. Mm. But upon the last time playing, I was like, I, probably because I'm replaying and I've already know, I already kind of know the game and stuff. You're like, hey, let's get it's with like, it. Yeah. Let's get with the pro. Let's move. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. I don't know. Uh, so far, I'm not too bothered by it. I'm actually more bothered by the battle music. Uh, hmm. I don't love it. <laughs> it, it. It feels super repetitive, and I just started the game. So. Really? Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> now, now this is a thing. Buckle up. This is a thing for Mitsuda, actually. Uh, Yes, yes. Um, he seems to really nail certain things. Battle music yeah. is the one area where I feel like he's not the greatest. Mm, I do okay. like his battle tracks in like Chrono Trigger yeah. and Xenogears quite a lot, um, with like a an exception here or there. But like Chrono Cross's main battle theme is real, real uh, difficult for me. <laughs> mm. uh, there's there's this funny kind of running joke, at least in my Discord with the people who interact with me there, because when I was doing my retrospective on Chrono Cross, I was trying to like talk about this specific music, like how do I describe this, right? <laughs> yeah. And I went on to the track on YouTube, and one of the best comments that I found there was, this is the sound um, of, of Clowns, oh. clowns raping you in hell or something oh like gosh. that. <laughs> this is the sound oh, you geez. hear. <laughs> and it, but that's kind of how it feels when you when you hear <laughs> okay, it. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, you know what? That's actually a perfect description <laughs> of the pizza. <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> so yeah, like shame on whoever commented that. But it was really funny. Oh, I'm sure. So is probably one of somebody who is going to watch this. Anyway, <laughs> this one's not that bad. But like uh, I, I kind of feel it grinding on me a little bit already. Yeah, but and, and yeah. a big problem is like with one exception, there's like there's no separate boss theme. Like boss oh, that theme. sucks. Yeah, I know. Oh. And I will say, yeah, it does mm. kind of wear on you. And like y- you're playing some of these like you know high stakes bosses later in the game, and like the same song is playing, and it's like it it kills the mood in a way. Oh, that um, sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's mm. it's. I, yeah, I don't love that, and like you're right in that the song. It's like I don't dislike the song either. It's but, not terrible. No, it, but it's it's one of the weaker tracks in the game for sure. It's just not like dynamic. It just kind of stays in the same sort of like it stays on the same sort of note, so to speak, and just kind of stays there. It doesn't like move a lot, you know, into another mm. section that does something real different and then come back and swing around to keep it interesting to listen to on loop. Hmm. And uh, I, I, I don't love like the instrument choice, it, it, the, the mixing of it, it kind of feels noisy and, and not very clean. And um, But other than that, like the battle system itself has not been a problem for me so far. But I, I would assume it's because it's a first playthrough, not like a revisit. Where you, you kind of you know what you're doing, and it's not new to you, and it's like uh, you're just pressing A to get through kind of right. thing, right? <laughs> hmm. So we'll see how I feel by the time the game's over. But um, and it is taking a while because there's a bit of a tutorial as you're playing the game. Like these yes. ba- these battles, I feel like are longer than battles will oh, continue sure, to be later there's on in the game. So mu- yeah. I feel like Monolith has gone back and forth on tutorials for yeah. years. Where they can't seem to get, it's like they just, it's yeah. a pendulum swing. It's like they tutorialize way too much in this game, right. then they do none of it in this game. <laughs> or they leave it totally mm. up to you to go like figure out how to make it work. And then people complain about that and then they swing way back over here and tutorialize way too much. That's what happens when you listen to the fans. You I end know. up like, okay, they don't like tutorials. Then it's like, no, bring them back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? It's not 
terrible because outside of yeah. this area, there's like very little, very it. little, and there's yeah. honestly very little else that they would need to. Aside from the battle system, I would say that that's really kind of all you need to know. Because mm. in this tutorial section, they do to kind of just the common battles, but also the what do they call them? The eggs, the A G W S. A G, yeah, the egg. Oh, the eggs, yeah, where yeah. Uh, you get into your little mech thing. They kind of yeah. do both of those during this tutorial section, right? Outside of that, like, what more does the game introduce in, in terms of like battle mechanics down the line? Is there anything? There's, there's not, and honestly, kind of the, the. The one thing I wished that this would have done, and going back to what you were saying about either too much or too little tutorials, like, I wish there would have been some sort of tutorial or guide or something for um, character customization. Mm. Uh, because there's a lot of mm. uh, customization options, both with the characters and the eggs. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can kind of be intimidating. Like, you can, yeah. you can figure mm. it out on your own, but, like, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, and mm. I wish that there would have been something, and I really don't think there is at all. That's interesting, mm. yeah. Because, I mean, a, a, a great example of this is Xenoblade Chronicles X, which has, like, a tome's worth of tutorials in the menu that you just go look up if you want to read on it. But they don't, like, tutorialize it in the game almost at all. Mm. But then Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which was the direct next game they did, where like every 10 seconds they're stopping you, not just for the first 10 hours, but for the whole fetching game. <laughs> <laughs> like tutorializing things, it's like, dude, frickin' hey. <laughs> Yeah, you can't you can't reread it afterwards. Oh, you can. So you can't just skip it and then go reread oh, it later. Oh, great! That's so, um, what? That's a what do you call it? That's a classic mistake. That's it's like bad, rookie man. rookie level. It's bad. I don't know what they were thinking there, but yeah. Jeez. Yeah, crazy. So, Monolith, get better at tutorials, please. Please do. All right. So, so I, have, I have a few notes before we get too far away from it. this. Um, so the idea that something odd was happening in the left hemisphere, ah, but right. that it's okay. Um, I wanted to bring up kind of where this anomaly was detected, right? It was the uh, the temporal, yeah, the temporal lobe. So I wrote down here, I did a little bit of research. The temporal lobes play an important role in processing effect and emotions, language, and certain aspects of visual perception. Yeah. So the dominant temporal lobe, which is the left side in most people, is involved in understanding language and learning and remembering verbal information, uh, but also dealing with emotions and context and things like that. Um, so I wonder how this will come into play later on. I'm assuming it will because There's some noise. they shouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. There's some, yeah, it, that's Chekhov's gun principle. Yes. Right? You don't bring it up unless it's going to be important. Exactly. So, so it's either going to be an emotional or a, ling a language barrier, like a block. So there, the noise was detected in Cosmos or in Xi'an? That's what I don't know. That's well, my next just, question. They're talking about the Encephalon and they're talking about the creation of Cosmos's body. So I believe it would be in Cosmos's brain. I would brain. assume it's Cosmos. That's what I think. That's what I think. But because you can definitely I, read it both ways. I couldn't tell because that dude because was also because Shion was being projected being, into. Like they're creating this sort of simulation for her to go. It's yeah. True. She's like connecting into it, right? Like Matrix style. So we'll leave that one as an asterisk for now. Sure. Um, uh, so this is where Shion decides to skip the 300 level process. Is moved to 400. Yes. Um, everyone's hesitant to do that. She insists that they'll be fine this time. Um, so once they begin the level 400 processes, uh, Xion says to Cosmos, I'll explain a bit about this place. This place is an imaginary space constructed within the network. It's modeled off of some ruins from early 2000 AD. Your mission That's is to right. fight the main target within the dilapidated building. The target is marked with the red vector box. Uh, there are objects in here that can be detonated. Some are effective if you set them off near an enemy. So this is like, you know, you shoot an object near an enemy and it'll like disable it for a second so you can get, uh, you know, behind it or whatever. Yeah, that's an interesting, um, interesting kind of thing. thing in the game. Um, use them to your advantage. Now then, let's start the mission. So um, I don't know how many notes you guys have on the tutorial stuff. Just the cu the cutscenes in between. We've got little machines make blue rings around the monolith that's in yes. outer space, and then this black like spaceship shows up, and I think it's it's yeah what it's we're the in. ship they're on yeah, yeah. yeah to come pick it and up, and then they come pick it up, and then they like boost or blast off into hyperspace, right? Yeah. Um, 
I also wanted to bring up that Shion Uzuki uh, is the username as she's signing in, but the password is ye shall be as gods. She, oh, really? Yeah, she signed in. I didn't in. see yeah. that. No so way. she had to sign into her little system, and the password was ye shall be as gods. Dude, that's but it, crazy. But it was. It was ye this time, not you. So oh. it's a reference directly to the King James Bible. Did you have more to um, say on that, TJ? Because that's no. Crazy. I just wanted to mention that in case either one of you missed it. Um, yeah. I didn't want. Totally not going to go any into any greater detail to say okay, what yes, you guys please. think. Um, as a password. Yeah. Interesting as a password. So you've got you've got the name and then the 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 secret name. Right, the secret yes, word, right? right? So the name is Xion. Xion. Is Xion entering this password? I believe so. Is so she correct, created TJ? a password, okay. ye shall be as she gods. She created this one. I have some guesses as to what that My brain is like to, exploding right yes. now with possibilities but, of like, <laughs> know, why this could be. But this is, once again, Xenogears callback. But yeah. also, here's the thing. So the name Xion, I, in Japanese, means Zion, Z-I-O-N. Mm. Um, and that's how they, and this is true in Korean as well, this is how they refer to Zion, is Xion. That's, that's, what, that's what they call it. Mm. Now, it also references a flower, a specific kind of a daisy flower. Um, so I don't know, but anyways, the name is Zion. The password is ye shall be as gods. So the secret name. Anyways, there's a connection. There, there has to be a connection. Oh my there goodness. just okay, has to. Okay, let's get back to this in a okay. second because there's the whole when she touches the Zohar and she has those... Yes! Very similar to Faye and Xenogers with the, the cross pendant. Oh my gosh, and even and the sound effect. Ting. Yeah, like there's, there's like something ding. going on with that that she's not aware of. Interesting. There's got to be something <laughs> that she's not aware. Like, how? Why would you create a password? You shall be as gods. I don't consciously. know. I don't know. I. <laughs> <that's> like kind of <laughs> kind of out there, right? That's yeah. But also, she did she actually touch the monolith, or she reached towards it? But then I think she went into like a dream world I, where she my touched speculation it in a dream, right? is that she actually made contact and didn't disappear. She became a contact of sorts. Right? Ah, I got you. Like Zen that's years. that's that's my okay. speculation on that. So I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> I should probably bring up, like, if we happen to be right about any of these, don't just just don't like, don't get upset at us. <laughs> um, I don't know how else to analyze a story other than to point out foreshadowing elements yeah. and what they might refer to later on. Yeah. Um, especially when I haven't played before. So just please, like, please be nice. I can't to us spoil in the a comments. game I haven't played. Exactly. <laughs> and even if it is something of a possible spoiler. Um, no one will know if you don't point it out. <laughs> so just don't don't say that it's a spoiler, and no one will know that it's a spoiler. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> this brings up a whole controversy on Twitter with with Dunky, but I'll just leave that to rest for now. Okay. Um, so just um, let it be known that Xion means several things in Japanese, but I can't get away from the. That's Zion really interesting in relation to the password, right? I, okay, I took a, I took a line of dialogue from Battle here that I had l lolled at. Uh, at the end of a battle, if uh, Cosmos finishes off, you know, in, in these types of games, whoever does the finishing blow gets to say the trademark phrase at the yes, end. Yes, of course, while of the, course. While this, Classic. She says, <laughs> my external appearance is down 5%. Xion, I need to be cleaned. <laughs> oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> What, you know, what the balls is that? Th they're giving a bit of a personality <laughs> to Cosmos I guess without, so. like, overdoing it. Yeah, it's that's kind of endearing in some some way. Yeah, I laughed really hard at that. That's pretty funny. Um, okay, so kind of at the end of this tutorial section, there's like this mech that phases through a wall and attacks you. Um, and this is the one. This is the battle that serves as the tutorial for the AGWS, the, the eggs, right? The anti gnosis uh, yes. weapon system, where you get into your little mech. Now, I have a question about this, and I, I think they say something about this later, but I think I was taking a note and I didn't quite like listen closely enough. Are they carrying like in a compact form somehow these mechs with them that they can just like <laughs> like transform into? Yeah, well. Like how does that work? I, it's never really gone into, you know, like it's it's just, I, I, I think ask. they have like a, I, I believe, um, and this is going from cutscenes from other games like, they have like basically a remote control and using some sort of like 
you know, you know, crazy thousands of years in the future technology, they can just materialize it right there. So it's just materializing. Okay, got it. Real quick, real quick. I can't get away from the the idea of, of a username and a password yes. being kind of layered here. Yeah. So I took another note here about how Cosmos is an anti-Gnosis humanoid fighter. And you have the password, which is like the subconscious of mm -hmm. the, you got the, the ego, which is the username, but then you've got like the secret, you know, yeah. um, which is ye shall be as gods, which would show that Shion has the secret desire to, to become as gods. Well, in right. the Bible, that happened through knowledge, right? right. The gaining of knowledge. Contact with um, Jesus, yeah. The gaining of knowledge is what enabled the uh, possibility to become as gods according to the serpent, right? Uh, but then, in so in her subconscious, there's this possibility that she wants or that she's thinking about, which which requires gaining knowledge. But then at the same time, in her in her actual work, her her job, she is programming anti gnosis. She's programming stuff yes. that's that is right. against knowledge, right? Right. There's a, there's a disconnect here. There's mm -hmm. something wrong with her waking life versus her her subconscious life and how that's going to come into conflict, right? Yes. I, I can I can I can see that. And and yeah, this is what I'm curious about because it seems to me she touches the Zohar, at least the one that's in the ship that may not be the original or the yeah. emulator or whatever it is. And she doesn't disappear. I and there's a little girl with orange hair mm -hmm. and a white dress. It's so similar to Xenogears. <laughs> I, I can't say for certain right now whether that's her as a girl, but based well, on I actually would say that it might not be. It, it could not be. I, I, have, I actually I have feel one like reason. it's a, a big possibility okay. that okay. it's not. I have one reason why it might not be. But so. I still wonder if Shion has had because she was from Milsha, that planet. Yes, that something. I wonder if there, she had yeah. had contact with the Zohar before. And this is why she doesn't disappear. And it's kind of like a memory that she's got, like a memory, right. or possibly Cause I was just a repressed thinking, memory. Yeah. Because I was just thinking, as you were saying, that whole thing about password and everything. Mm -hmm. Why would she put that as her password if she hasn't made contact with the Zohar yet? But it's pr now I'm thinking maybe that's not her first contact with the Zohar. Well, and or I would the say, original one in my mind, one. she didn't actually physically make contact there. She reached and then she went into a trance and then she came out and she, I, it didn't seem like she touched She was there. close. She was recalling but a possible previous moment where she had already she, made It was contact. kind of rippling in the black and white you're right. I'm going to call it a flashback. It may not be You're a flashback. Right. It may be a vision. So but maybe she got close she enough. She touches it and it's sort of rippling around her hand. Yes. And it's like in a field or something. Yes. It's, like, it's a whole different place. Yeah. yeah. And the little girl goes, turns and walks into it. And then, anyways, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We'll Way ahead of ourselves. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. But as we as we are battling and finally Shion puts Cosmos to the test, like the max power, like, do show me what you got, right? Um, she pushes Cosmos system to the limit, and in the chaos, everything just kind of, there's this catas catastrophic, like, situation. It was just too yeah. much, too much. But she sees this young girl in white. Yes. In this moment, right? Uh, she, this girl has a white dress, blue eyes, Shion's eyes are green. Green, right. Th that's where I think they're different people. They're different people. Um, yeah. Reddish or maybe blonde hair, which is similar to Shion. Um, and they bear the vector... Oh, sorry, sorry. I wrote something else. Uh, Shion does not mention her to anyone. Shion knows not to talk about this girl. Mm. She didn't say anything. They even ask her, did you? Did anything, anything weird happen? What happened? And she's like, nothing. Nothing. Mm. And she goes on. So there's this thing that's like something crept up into her mind and she was able to see something that, that she knows she shouldn't talk about. So mm. anyways, very, very interesting stuff there. Um, and uh, then they kind of pull her out, right? They kind of extract her, yeah. they end the sim right at that point. Uh, the, some of the things they say during that alert, right? A brand new network is being created within the Cosmos mainframe. We've never had a reaction like this before. This is incredible. I've never seen a net grow so fast. Yeah. Look at it, sir. Portions of the Encephalon map are evolving. So, hmm. uh, Cosmos and that's is evolving Cosmos. at some yeah. in, on some level. So Cosmos here. is learning and gaining gnosis Knowledge or something in mm -hmm. at some crazy raid, and it's because of this test and because of whatever just happened it caused this influx of. That's a good. You know, that's a good point. There's something tied to gnosis that evolves Cosmos. The network starts growing at a rate they've never seen before. It's evolving. That's similar There's to... There's some contact yeah. with this little girl who's 
connected, as far as I can tell, with the Zohar somehow. Somehow, somehow. That evolves that's cosmos. That's clear. Yes. And that's all tied to Gnosis. Somehow. In some way. <laughs> and, but the, the Gnosis is what cosmos resists, right? So, anyways, that's good stuff. Um, oh, so after the battle, Shion tells Cosmos to activate the Hilbert effect. Yes, yes, and okay. So, the Hilbert effect, you do see this happen later on. I don't know if yeah. we should bring it up now or later on. Uh, but, well, they explain what it does. Oh, okay, okay. Right, or do they do it here or do they not do it here? Do they not explain it here? Okay. Okay, they do it later, so let's okay. talk about that later when it happens. I want to really quickly talk about the person who is being... Hilbert? Who, yeah, uh, let me pull it up. Hiruberto. I, I had it on my other computer, now I don't have it, now I'm going to look it up again. I'm going to pull it up here. So David Hilbert is wow. who they're referencing here. He was a uh, German mathematician, one of the most influential mathematicians of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Nice. Hilbert discovered and developed a broad range of fundamental ideas in many areas, including invariant theory, the calculus of variations, com uh, commute commutative algebra, algebraic number theory, the foundations of geometry, special theory of operators and its applications to integral equations, mathematical physics, and the foundations of mathematics. So the student was a really smart yes. mathematician. <laughs> when we're talking about math, that's crazy. That's yeah. quite the resume. <laughs> this um, this guy's like a founder yeah. of like many of the the disciplines of mathematics yeah. that we that we know. So when you talk about math, we're talking about the abstract, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about numbers and we're talking about the unseen world, right? Sure. That the laws apply to this world, but they in and of themselves don't technically exist in this don't world. Don't technically they're exist. symbols and right. they're they're things that exist abstractly. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, we'll talk about exactly what that is. But the Hilbert, sure. Hilbert effect is a little later. So they had picked up this monolith 10 days ago, and now they're bringing it somewhere. They keep jumping through these hyperspace-like... Yeah, what, they what do call, you call them, them gating. They call it gating yeah. out. Do, do. Yeah, gates. And it seems sort yeah. of like what you do if you're like on a VPN and you don't want anyone <laughs> to catch you. you. You're kind of routing through different places. It's a network or It's hard yeah. to, to trace. It's hard for people to track where you are. Uh, um, I think there's somebody on yeah. the bridge, one of the pilots or something, who says specifically that they are, <coughs> uh, the, that the Newtonian um, Newtonian laws no longer apply. Uh, he, he, I, I think I took down some of the dialogue because I thought it was really funny because he keeps joking with you, like, "Oh no, the coal is burning out" or something. No, just kidding. We don't use coal on this ship. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really <laughs> stupid. But you it's you like, make a four thousand year old joke like that. <laughs> Just normally. Like, who the fetch is using coal like, well, 4,000 years We talk about pyramids. Like, oh, just kidding, Mike. We don't use pyramids <laughs> anymore, huh? Yeah, huh, huh, Mike? That's why it was funny, right? <laughs> but it was, I That's guess, classic. kind of this funny way of trying to basically say uh, they don't use Newtonian yeah. dynamics okay. in, in anymore. Okay, so, so there's a more efficient energy source So he now. says, like, oh, oh, this isn't good. It looks like they've used low-grade coal to the exhaust, or so the exhaust is thick. At this rate, they'll see us coming from beyond the horizon. <laughs> That's so funny. And then funny, he's like, ha, 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 just kidding. The main engine on this ship is a Zuse Model 2, a cutting-edge logical drive. It doesn't use coal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I actually really like that. As a way to introduce the player yeah. into this new world, yeah. That's funny. Like, yeah. I actually really like that. That's a cute, fun way it, to do it's, it. I, I felt the same way. It's like it's yeah. really dumb, but it's, it's dumb charming. in this endearing way <laughs> yes. that JRPGs kind of are in this abstract yeah. sense. Totally. And who knows, this might be a character that just makes obscure 4,000-year-old <laughs> joke references, and that's just his thing, you know? Like, that's funny. I don't know. Uh, and then he goes, oh, shoot. We're low on hypergol. Uh, hey, you got any good oxidizer? <laughs> I'm just kidding. This ship doesn't use chemical propulsion either. It's completely free of the limitations of Newtonian dynamics. Oh my gosh, so, that's great. That's that's awesome. I, I was that. laughing at that. That was hilarious. Um, what was that in reference to? What were we just talking about? Oh, uh, we were just <laughs> talking about. I don't know. That was just some fun dialogue. Why did that? Why did that come to my mind? I don't remember well, exactly. We're, we're talking, talking about, Hilbert about and Hilbert, but then the ten days ago they picked up the thing and they're jumping through all hyperloops the gates and the Newtonian laws no longer apply. Yeah, so that was it. The technology that of yes. this time, right? Okay. So they we also get a little bit of info here. A planet vanished where they found this monolith. Am I yeah. right about that, TJ? Is this with the monolith? Okay. 
So a planet just freaking disappeared. We've already seen someone touch the this thing. This is Milsha, right? And that person right? disappeared. Milsha, the planet? Is that what we're referring to? I don't know. It doesn't say. Oh. Milsha, I think, is referenced a little bit later. This is just, there is no planet. The planet is gone. And instead there's a oh, Zohar. In the place we're on now, there where, was a planet who used to be, that used to be there. I believe that's what this is. Is that correct, TJ? Is that correct, TJ? Um, wait, did I say that again? I'm sorry. A planet vanished. And they found the Zohar in its place. I put this note as a question mark because that's what I gathered from this discussion here. Yes, yeah, that, that is correct. Okay, so it is correct. So a planet freaking vanished and they found this thing. But okay. what happens when you touch this thing? You vanish. You vanish right. So there's something going on with this thing that makes things vanish. I don't yeah, know. Right. However it works. I don't know if that's how all of these monoliths work, but that's how this one works. And we're, we're now seeing people that have very different uniforms mm. to Xion and her crew, right? These people don't resemble the monolith like at all. And they're talking about like the Galactic Federation and there's the commander and, oh, what's his name? I can't remember the commander's name. He's uh, and he, Cherenkov? Yeah, or, Cherenkov. Yeah. I think it's Cherenkov. He is no, no, no. Or or Are it's talking the, about Virgil. Or it's Virgil. I think it might be Virgil. Um, I wrote down here the commander because I don't know names. I'm sorry. Is envious of his crew's ignorance, right? That was Cherenkov. That, yeah. that was Cherenkov. Okay, yeah. he's like, man, ignorance is bliss. You guys don't know, like. Right how good you have it kind of thing. He wishes that he could go back Here's to a place where he did not know. reference to having Gnosis comes with, Gnosis. with great knowledge comes great responsibility. I know, and some people aren't up for that, man. Some people aren't about that responsibility. They just want to get rid of that Gnosis so they can live a simple life. Right. And this commander seems to be... He knows that, something they don't know. That's why he's so hard on everyone, because he knows stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, so... I so it also seems to me that the military thinks that Cosmos has been tested in real situations. It seems like they don't know that this is all theoretical. Yes. A lot of the crew don't even know about Cosmos at all. Yes, that's true. Like Virgil didn't secret, know about yeah. that. Yeah. So, and if you talk to the crew members on the ship, a lot of them will share their just like, you know, anxiety about this mission. Something's not right about it. What is that thing we brought on board? Yeah. What are we really here for? I wish the captain would yes, at least lie to questions, us lots of to questions. give us like some something uh, comfort or something like oh, that. There's Tell us anything. Call back but they're to not... something mythological. Well, there. Most yeah. people yeah. In, in the ship are in the dark about what is really going on. Yeah. yeah. Which is pretty dangerous. I think even the captain to some degree is not like fully in on what's oh, actually happening. Oh, I think so. I think, it's, I think so. Yeah. So I have this here that Xion is purposefully only using simulations because she doesn't want to actually wake up uh, yes. Cosmos into the real world, right. right? And that what I wrote here is that Xion wants to keep Cosmos in a dream world. Mm. And my next note is anti-gnosis indeed, right? Okay. So Xion is the creator of whatever system that Cosmos is using. Oh, dude. And Xion is something of something of a god to Cosmos, although Cosmos seems to resemble a god more so than any other character we've met so far. Uh, but Xion has control over Cosmos, and yeah. Xion loves Cosmos so much that she actually wants to keep Cosmos in the dark. Yes. Xion wants to withhold the fruit of knowledge from her creation. Yeah. She wants to keep Cosmos in a dream world, right? So once again, the idea of the Garden of Eden and Antinosis and ye shall be as gods, it all comes back into play here again. Yeah, and, and I was going to bring up, there's there's somewhat of a disconnect between, like, if you see, like, what Xion was doing when she was in the simulation, she was always the one that's like, oh, let's skip to the 400 level thing, let's do all this, like, yeah. stuff that, like, you know, Alan was saying, like, no, this is dangerous, this is dangerous, like... And so she wants, she wants Cosmos to progress, but in in the Garden of Eden situation that she created for Which Cosmos. Which she will not take that step yeah. to wake her up in real life. You've got this, this microcosm is pretty deep. This here is pretty cool. because now Xion <laughs> is the demiurge to Cosmos. In, in, in a, a way. way, yes. It's like Cosmos can represent the demiurge in her own way because she's kind of yeah. crazy. But, but Xion, Xion can as well. To, to Cosmos is kind of Cosmos' mother. Yeah. yeah. And that Xion is something of a demiurge in that sense as well. Wow. Yeah, that she even thinks of herself in her subconscious as something that can be as a god at the very least. You should um, be as but, gods. Yes, but at the same time, she's like not exactly being the benevolent god that would give knowledge freely to sure. his children. Yeah, 
Anyways, so great, I, I great stuff. I took a here. note here about the Vanish Planet thing. Oh, did you? Um, because there's a, one of the girls on the bridge is asking for a debriefing. They're like, Captain, can you please actually explain what's going on, right? Ah, yes. They, they're, they were ordered to investigate a vanished planet. There you go. And they found but this But ever monolith. since, they picked up that the Zohar, everything has oh, now changed. Oh, so I, my assumption was the Zohar was where the planet vanished. I think it was. And it may be the case. Okay, good. Okay, okay. I think that they went there and the crew was all assuming we're yeah. here to investigate a vanished planet, but they found this thing in its place not knowing what it is. And, and they're they, like, well, they picked we'll that thing it, up and it's like, well, what's this have to do with investigating? I think they are connected, but the crew hasn't made the connection that they're connected yet. Sure, okay, gotcha. That this, this Zohar had something to do with the vanishing of this planet. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> My next note is, Haha, the dude likes the girl. Yes. Uh, Alan is, is, is... Alan? In, you know the music that plays during <laughs> that section? I think I took oh, a note I on what the music is. I don't is. recall. I, I thought it was a really weird choice of music. I think it's called Every Day. There's this... It's, this, it's a little piano piece with like some kind of like... It's real upbeat. It's almost like elevator music <laughs> as he's going around talking. <laughs> oh, oh, like yeah. when, when the... When the Alan's getting like picked on for like in yes. that scene. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah I think that's like the standard, and that's one of the few songs that's kind of it, it'll be repeated in a couple other scenes. That that seems to be like okay. when we need some more lighthearted kind of music. Like that's yeah. what plays. Oh, I have a note here. The I think you already touched on this case. And the um, chief, there was that strange interference earlier. Did anything unusual happen during the dive? There's no mm. record of it on our log, and she doesn't talk about it, so that's there you what go. There, there you go. She I, doesn't I'm gonna mention skip the girl. A little bit here. Um, I, oh. My next note's about the email press release. <laughs> the Unis Mundus Network. Yes, UMN. that's where I'm at. Yep. I have... Can you, have, can you Xenosaga fandom no, that No, I can quick? tell you right okay. now what this is. What this is, is a Carl Jung reference. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. Unis Mundus is... Uh, well, it's an idea that's been around for a long time, but Carl Jung kind of re-brought it back into, like... Public well, Unus knowledge. means one. Unus right. is one, and united also, okay. and Mundus is world. World. So okay. the one world, the united world. Okay. That's one what it means. It means the united yeah. world, right? So it's something like the World Wide Web, right? But it's the united world network, right? So the Unus, the Unus Mundus is one world. Um, it's a little bit like Plato's Eidos. The idea is that there exists a perfect world outside of our own, from which everything in our world derives but it exists in its perfect form out there, right? Including the entire world itself. You can think of it as though everything that we're seeing is a shadow of the real thing being projected in a 3D environment. It's the idea of an abstract heaven-like structure that informs the lower earth structure that we inhabit in the universe that we know. Mm. So my next thing is that's sweet and all, but it seems like they might just say, be saying unus mundus, meaning like the internet, the world is connected. Yeah. It may not have anything to do with Carl Jung's kind of like Well, it was, uh, it was almost 50-50 in Xenogears where it was just a reference to something for a reference's sake. And it didn't sake, mean anything. Or it yeah. actually was applied <laughs> to the, like the, the theme of the game somehow. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll find out if that's true here too. Yeah. But there's like a press release. You get these press releases on your phone and there's a freaking, there's a freaking bunny. Like what yeah. is this? Well, what is this? She thing? has a she has a phone that is in the shape I've of that, that thing. Yeah, but it also is like a thing that's in like some three D environment. Yeah, it's like, that, like a, talks to it's you. It's like a like an AI. It's a, it's almost, a Moogle. Or something. Yeah. But I wrote that it reminds me of the Chows in Sonic Adventure Two. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, those things are hilarious. Um, it's called the Rios. R I O S and Rio means to laugh in Spanish. Mm. It also means river, but whatever. River. Yeah. Laugh is you know more relevant here I think yep. is this intentional I don't know it's like a joke and I don't know what it is and I don't know what's happening <laughs> like what this bunny just shows up and starts telling yeah. you things like I I'm very confused by it where is it is it just on her phone anyways I'm, I'm a little confused. I want to talk about this and maybe I think we can leave off on this episode here real quick about pacing for what we played so far yeah um, I feel like it's pretty slow Okay. I feel like there are a lot of scenes where I just go like, okay, did we need that scene? Like the one, like I know like the scenes with Alan, it's supposed to establish Alan likes Shion. Yeah. And he's yeah. nervous and he doesn't know what to do, how to ask her out. I feel like we also kind of got that same thing during 
the actual tutorial section. I think like they made some references to that or they made fun of her, poke photo. Anyways, yeah, I felt like there sure. were a couple of scenes that yeah. were, I just kind of felt like, oh, I don't know if that needed to be there or whatever. That's not really important in the scheme of things. I feel like these emails like really, really slow the game down a lot. Really? If you are you actually get a lot reading of them. them you all get a the lot time. of, I knew, you're walking every new room you go into. It's like, bloop, here's an email, email, and it's like 25 paragraphs of text. And it's hard to not <laughs> read it, though. Like, I actually yeah. equate this a little bit to Final Fantasy VIII with the weapon magazines yeah. that tell you yes. about, like, guns and stuff. And, yes. And uh, I, anyways, like, I can't not read it, and it's fascinating, but yeah, it slows things down quite a bit. I feel like it's really slow, but I know you mentioned this, TJ, in your videos about pacing. Do you want to kind of talk about your feelings on pacing for this? Yeah. On the pacing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated because, like, well, let me just say, like, about the email thing first, because it's a second giver. Um, the email thing, like, I will say the emails do, like, you get a lot of them at this point in the game, and then, like, yeah. later on they sort of, like, you get a lot less and like most of them I'm sure it can't it can't sustain this level. yeah <laughs> like a lot of the ones you get here are like and because the email system is basically like it's you know a lot of like there are like um side quests that are done it's like a, it's like a quest log right for your side quests yeah well sort yeah sort of i mean there's some side quests that don't have anything to do with the email thing at all but like some of them do and like um a lot of the stuff like yeah it, it slows down after this and uh and, sure. like, a lot of the stuff you do get is you can skip. Like, it's a lot of just side content, like, additional world building and stuff. Um, but with regards to the pacing itself, and it's it's complicated because, like, you have to remember, like, and I, I sort of have to, like, be forgiving on, like, the series as a whole when I, you know, like, with some of the criticisms I have because like this was meant to be like the very, very, very beginning of this like huge, yeah. massive story. Yeah. And so a lot of this game, it is definitely like for a lot of people, it is going to be slow because mm -hmm. a lot of it, it's meant to sort of like establish the, you know, this massive, world and get you know get all these characters set up and like it's like i don't know like i'm like i'm okay with it since like i'm cool with that kind of like really like in depth yeah, yeah. like well but it's I'll it's okay. like, but there are going to be some people who are going to be like, yeah, this is this is like yeah. too slow for sure. So I I did not take a note about the pacing of this game for a very long time. Here, my I took I did, I don't take a note about the pacing of this game until we're two hours in, where um, I am like saying, okay, it's getting a little slow. It's not for a while for me. Okay. Um, I didn't even think that, and and when I did think that. That's right before something actually started to happen. So yeah. I actually feel like the game was paced pretty well for me, at least okay. as I was going through things. I guess my... Like, I would say this part is probably, like, the slowest part of the game by far. Because so much yeah. of it is, like, is is meant to give, like, the player the bare bones, like, basic information of, like, what is this world? What are, the what are like, the basic things you need to know to understand this story and how this world functions and like this freaking bunny this freaking rabbit this this fluffy yeah they're all like who makes an android in this day and age and then this fluffy bunny droid shows up and it's everyone it's this is perfectly normal yeah everyone's like oh this is fine yeah. anyways sorry keep going um yeah no i think I, that, that's all i have <laughs> okay so my thought on this is like I'm by no means somebody who feels like you gotta have an action scene to like make something interesting and keep it moving. Like yeah. that's not my feeling on how pacing should, it's not about, oh, we need an action scene to keep it going or to, to make it right. feel like it's moving somewhere. Uh, by no means. Um, I love shows that, and movies and stories that, that are slow burns and that give you lots of uh, background. But there are ways to go about doing that, I feel, that, that make it really interesting, that get, drop mysteries yeah. and that go, oh, what's that about? Oh, what's that about? But like, you don't have enough time to linger on it because we're going into another one now. Yeah. And you're just being, it feels like you're almost being 
inundated with like mystery upon mystery. And that's a way to world build and slowly move and introduce things while keeping it feeling like it's not slow, right? So for instance, mm -hmm. um, I always talk about hooks being really important, right? Like the opening scene, the FMV, yeah. I think is a pretty interesting hook. I don't it's think it's as strong as say yeah. Xenogears opening scene, which is just Oh my gosh. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't feel a hook into this story beyond that opening FMV until the Reallians were introduced. Ah, that's coming up and here. Yeah, that yeah. was when I was like, okay, that's something I want to know more about. Oh yeah, for sure. For right? sure. I don't really with all due respect, give much of a fetch right now that Alan likes Shion. Because I, I don't know these characters <laughs> right. well right. enough yeah, yet yeah. for that to be like something for me to really get invested in. Yet. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, you can quib about that quickly in a scene that I think would be better served to drop a mystery of some kind, yeah. say, about Cosmos or. I feel like the way to fix pacing is not to, oh, we need an action sequence. It's, you need a mystery. You need to tell me something that gives me a promise of, ooh, that's mm. tasty. I need to know more about that. And I want to know now, but you're not going to let me, so I have to keep following you <laughs> to get it. Right? And eventually I'll stop following you if and you don't give it to me. I feel like I got that when they introduced the Reallians. That was and the, fascinating. And it was like, okay, and yes. what happened on Milsha and yes, um, the D, what, what is it, the DME addiction? Yeah, for Virgil. Yeah. Virgil. I was like, wait a second. Like, this yeah. is cool. Like, now I need to know more. But that was at least, it I want to say, while. two hours into Maybe the game hours. or close to that. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, this is just me. This is just my personal non-game developer philosophy mm. on games. <laughs> um, but I feel like, for me, the hour mark is a really important mark. Mm, okay. If I've played an hour into your game and I've not had a single battle yet, say like Persona 4, like <laughs> it's gonna bug me. <laughs> well, you right? do battles. You've had battles you, you in do this. The tutorial so I'm not battles. saying it's the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. I'm just giving an example okay. of the hour mark's an important mark for me. Yeah. So we've had some battling, but I felt like since the opening FMV hook or mystery, there wasn't another like significant mystery or hook for me until the Reallians, which was way beyond that hour mark. I and I you. feel like that's why it started to feel like, okay, yeah. where is this going? Like, yeah. when is something going to happen yes. again? Right? Which is funny, because even after the Reallians, you don't... It still takes a little it's, while. This game is very cutscene heavy. Yeah. And it's very email heavy. <laughs> so email heavy. Cutscenes and emails, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the world of cutscenes and emails. Yeah. But everyone, speaking of pacing, it yeah. is time for us to, it's time to wrap end up this episode. episode two here. Yeah. And we're going to just record episode three right on the heels. Right on the back of it. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Kaysen and I will probably not be in the comments much during this series. Yeah, sorry about that. If TJ cares to, we welcome him to yes. interact. <laughs> but it's up to him because that's a time sink. And, yeah. you know, you got a life to live. But And um, check out TJ the Emperor. Check out his channel on yes. YouTube. And feel free to discuss, you know, what we're talking about. We yeah. will come back and revisit We will. Eventually. We will eventually. But in the but meantime, TJ might be a better person to bounce ideas off of Or than us. amongst yourselves, you know. <laughs> or amongst yourselves. Okay, discuss. great. But so, we'll see you guys next time. Yes. Peace out. Peace.